Our Father in heaven, as we open your word that you have given to us this morning, we ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to take these words, make them reality in our lives, and bring this truth home to our hearts. We pray for a clearer understanding of Jesus, his work for us, and what is possible because of him. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So what the Bible says about growing in Christ and why it matters. I want to start with a very interesting story I found as I was searching yesterday for an introduction to today's uh, subject. Here's a picture. Now this story is from uh, probably about 10 years ago. But this is a picture of Nikki Freeman, who was at that time 40 years old. And you might ask, well, which one is the 40-year-old, right? Nicky is the boy on the right side being held by his mother. He has an extremely rare condition. In fact, as I was looking online, <clears throat> several sites said only a dozen or fewer people in the entire world have this condition. It's so rare they don't even have a name for it. It's just called disease X. Um, but basically what happens is that he, age, he ages very, very slowly about a quarter of the speed that most of us age. So he's actually 40 years old in this picture, but he has the body and the bones and the mental capacity of, of a 10-year-old. He's not the only one with this. Here's another uh, girl that has a very similar condition. This was off of YouTube, and there was a special made about her as well as some of the others like her, again, several years ago. The title you can see, this eight-year-old girl has hardly grown since she was born. They are Benjamin Button children, only about half a dozen of them in the world, who age only one year for every four in the life of a normal human being. And so far, doctors can find nothing wrong with them. Their chromosomes are normal, but they all have cognitive deficiencies. Gabby is blind and will never speak. Now, there's a lot of tragic things in life, but I can't think of something that would be uh, more difficult as a parent than this, right? Having a child that never grows up. And obviously, we know in ourselves that uh, we were not designed to be this way, right? Uh, so what, what is more tragic than not growing up? Now, our topic this morning is growing in Christ, right? We're going to be looking at what the Bible says about what God expects for us as we continue in our relationship for Him. But what would be more tragic than a Christian that never grows up, right? What would be more tragic than a Christian that is growing at only a quarter the pace that God has promised we can and that He will enable us to? That'd be a tragedy, wouldn't it? So let's take a close look at this this morning. Question number one, what is... God's will for us. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So does God want us to grow up, to become something bigger or better or more complete and mature than we are right now? The answer is easy, isn't it? Yes, God definitely wants that for us. And this verse is pretty clear here that the goal that we have is to be like Christ, right? This is God's promise of maturity is that he can make any of us who give our lives to him over a process of time, we can reflect Jesus more and more and more. Now let's finish this passage, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And then verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a child, amen? I'm pretty certain that we all started out there at one point. There's nothing wrong with being a child. That is how God intends us to begin life. 
But there is something that the wires get crossed, right, if we never mature beyond that place. So imagine the tragedy of a Christian that never grows, one who is content with the initial experience of conversion. Maybe you remember the time or place where you experienced that moment of conversion. Now, for some of us, right, we have grown up as Christians, or we've grown up in a Christian family, and I'll just speak for myself. I can't look back at one specific moment in my life where I all of a sudden had this experience, right? It's something that I grew into as I became older and older. Some of you have different stories. You have different experiences, right? You grew up without knowing anything about God or with a wrong idea of God, and you can look back to one moment in your life or one day or one experience and say, that was it right there where I, I was saved, I was converted. Whatever that experience may be, God doesn't want us to stay where we were when we first had that experience with God. Imagine the tragedy of a Christian who is trusting in the forgiveness of the cross, but not in its power. That'd be a tragedy, wouldn't it? Imagine the tragedy of a Christian that is satisfied with the first lifestyle changes that accompany their walk with Christ, but feel no need of ongoing changes as they continue walking with Jesus. There would be a misfire there in the Christian experience, wouldn't there? Imagine the tragedy of a Christian that only grows one year out of every four. That makes a walk a lot longer than it needs to be, doesn't it? If we even ever get there. What would a church comprised of these kinds of Christians look like? You ever thought of that? If you had a church full of Christians that were immature and not advancing or growing with Christ. We don't actually have to guess. The Apostle Paul gave us a pretty clear picture. So turn in your Bible. This one will not be on the screen, but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now Paul dealt with lots of young Christians, didn't he? He was a church planner, and he went all around the ancient civilized world planting churches, and then he would come back and revisit those churches. And as he went on these missionary journeys, some of the churches, I'm sure, were very encouraging to visit because they were healthy, they were active, they were growing in Christ. And then some of the churches had a different story, right? Some were really struggling, like the church in Corinth. If you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is calling out a lot of the deviant behavior that the Christians were caught up in. They were falling back into their old way of living before they knew Christ. Now, here's what he says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, are we there? We live in a perilous world, don't we? We often look at what's happening out there or what's coming in at us from the outside, and certainly there are a lot of perils. But let's keep reading what Paul says, because there is a different kind of danger that he's focused on here. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Verse 4 goes on. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And if, if it just stopped right there, we could think, wow, that's a pretty good picture of the world, right? Glad we're not part of that. But he goes on in verse 5, and he brings it home. He says, these people have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof from such turn away. He's really talking about Christians. And he's talking about churches that are full of Christians that are not growing in Christ. They're not maturing in their walk. Instead, they're still tied to the same habits, the same um, ways of thinking, the same uh, lifestyles, perhaps, in some cases, that they had before they became Christians. And he says they have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power thereof. They're denying Christ even though with their words they believe. And maybe in their hearts they believe they're following him, but somewhere there is a misfire. There is a short circuit somewhere. Next question. 
what word summarizes this growth process in a Christian's life. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Again, Paul writes, he says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, if you're like me, <clears throat> there have been and continue to be times in your life where you really pray, I need to know the Lord's will, right? If the Lord could just speak to me and tell me His will in this situation, or maybe, you know, for younger people, what do I do with my life? Or, or who, who do I marry at some point? I need to know the Lord's will. And God, God cares about all of those things. But we're given a great explanation of what God's will is for every single one of us. And it is that we be sanctified. Now, the Greek word there is hagiosmos, and it means to set apart, to purify, or to cleanse from sin, right? Now, that makes sense. This is God's will for every single Christian, that we will be set apart from the world, purified and cleansed from sin, all so that we can have a closer relationship with Jesus. We can't grow up into Christ if we don't have a living relationship with Him. And these are things, if we're not set apart, if we're not being uh, divided from the things in this world, we can't grow up into Christ because these are things that come in the way of that kind of experience and relationship. Here's another passage again by Paul, Romans 6, verse 22. But being now made free from sin and become servants unto God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now, it's translated as a different word there, holiness, but it's the same Greek word, hagiosmos. So sanctification means to be made holy, right? Or to live a holy life. It's a process that requires God's help. We can never do it on our own. But he promises to help us grow as we walk with him. One more example, Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified, same basic root word there in Greek, by faith that is in me. So what does it mean to be sanctified? You look here at Acts 26, verse 18. To have our eyes opened, right? In, in the Bible, your eyes represent understanding, right? And as you spend time with God, you will start to see yourself, and you will see others, and you will see life differently than we did before, right? So our understanding is opened. Our eyes are opened. And to turn us from darkness to light. A couple weeks ago, we studied Nicodemus, right? That Jewish ruler that came to Jesus. You remember, when, when did he come to Jesus for that interview? He came at night, right? And we saw that Nicodemus came to Jesus because he was essentially unconverted. He was not yet born again. He was still most comfortable in the darkness. And that's where we all are before Jesus begins his work with us. But he's trying to get us to be more comfortable in the light, right? More comfortable in the truth. Now, the next phrase in this verse, and to turn us from the power of Satan to the power of God. We are born as sinners. We are born with a fallen nature. And by default, right, Satan has power over us because of that thing called sin. And the work of sanctification is to free us from the power of Satan and to place us under the power of God. The thing is, God can't just bust in, like, uh, you know, with special forces and yank us out of that situation, like you see on the news sometimes when they rescue hostages, right? He could. I mean, he's stronger than Satan. He could do that if he wanted to. But he only does it with our permission, right? And as we allow that to work in our lives. So... It's different than what you see on the news with these special ops forces going in at night and yanking people out of a situation. He has to, uh, he can only do it as we give him permission in our lives. So turning us from the power of Satan unto the power of God. Now, here's my summary. Christ's death on the cross provided the legal justification for our salvation, right? Somebody had to pay the penalty of sin, and Jesus paid that penalty. 
Sanctification represents the actual transfer of ownership from sin, rebellion, and death to holiness, obedience, and life. Now, justification happened or is made possible, right, at one moment in history when Jesus dies on the cross. He pays the price. One of the questions we're going to have to look at today, and we'll find an answer to it, does sanctification, did it also happen at one moment in the past, or is it something that we experience as we grow day by day? We'll see the Bible's answer to this. Some people will say, well, sanctification... Your sanctification happened at the cross as well, just like your justification. And I have a question. If that is true, then why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Jesus made it clear that he will come back when his people reflect his character, right? When the harvest is ripe. That's sanctification. We'll we'll dive into that a bit more. That process of maturing or growing is sanctification. If that all happened at the cross, then why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Why has he waited 2,000 years? That would actually make God into the sadistic monster that a lot of people claim and believe he is. So there must be a reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet. And it does have something to do with this process of sanctification. Now, when we studied Nicodemus, and his conversation with Jesus, we notice some parallels with the sanctuary. So as Jesus was explaining the new birth experience there in John chapter 3, he said to Nicodemus, uh, you cannot see, um, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he seems to repeat himself a few verses later in John 3 verse 5, he says, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, this is review. Hopefully, you were here a few weeks ago when we looked at this. And we saw that the sanctuary has three curtains, and those three curtains represent the stages in the new birth experience. So when Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, he's referring to that first curtain, which would bring you from outside the sanctuary into the courtyard. And when you walk through that first curtain there on the lower left side of that fence, you stand in front of the altar of burnt offering. That represents Jesus' death for us on the cross. And Jesus is really saying, until you accept me as your Savior, as the one who has died in your place, you can't even see where you're going, right? Your eyes have not been opened, the eyes of your understanding. You can't even see where the kingdom of God is. But then Jesus circles back again in verse 5 of John chapter 3, and he says, Unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so we saw that the water represents baptism. And there was water in that wash basin standing right in front of the second curtain in the sanctuary as the priest would go from the courtyard into the holy place, that first part of the tabernacle itself. So that tent, the tabernacle, represents the kingdom of God, right? And there's two parts in there. There is the holy place that has the candlestick and the bread and the altar of incense. But then there's a third curtain right behind the altar of incense. And behind the third curtain is the most holy place. And um, that represents the goal of our faith, doesn't it? Union with God as we become united with Christ. Now, there are words that we can uh, attach to each of these parts of the experience in the process of salvation. So justification is, again, the price that Jesus paid. This is the legal aspect of salvation. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And uh, so the things in the courtyard we can think of as representing justification. But then there's sanctification, the process of growing uh, in our lives closer and closer to Jesus. And the items in the holy place, again, those three things, the candlestick, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread, these really represent the process of growth and sanctification in our lives. So the table of showbread, that bread represents the Word of God. It represents Jesus himself. 
we grow as we eat the nourishment from the Word of God as we spend time with Jesus. The altar of incense represents prayer. We grow as we spend time in prayer, as we learn how to trust in God. The candlestick represents our witness to the world. Jesus told his disciples, you are the light of the world. So as the Holy Spirit works in us and lives in us and shines out through us, we grow as we share with others as well. And then the third and final part of this experience of salvation is glorification. And this reflects what happens in the most holy place. This is union with Christ. It's part, a participation in the divine nature, right? And uh, this is represented again by the most holy place. So let's look a little more closely at sanctification. How are we sanctified? How are we set apart? How are we purified? How are we cleansed from the things in our life that would keep us from God? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. This is a recurring theme that we see especially in the New Testament. And that is that the Word of God is one of the agents that, that God uses to sanctify us. In John, if you have your Bible handy, let's go to John chapter 17. Jesus is praying here, his last great prayer before his death. <clears throat> and he's praying for his disciples, which means he's also praying for us. And Jesus prays in John 17, verse 17. He says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word of God is one of the two agents that God uses to work this miracle of sanctification or growth in our lives. Now the other one is the Holy Spirit. And the two work together. Think about creation. There in Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that God creates the physical world through two primary agencies. And it's the same thing. It's the Holy Spirit and it's the power of the Word of God, right? The Holy Spirit is hovering over the face of the deep. And then God says, or in John 1, it's the Word, right? And those two together produce life. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit produce spiritual life in us. They produce growth. There is no better summary I have found of what true sanctification is than uh, this passage that you have in your handout. I'm going to read it in just a moment from the Great Controversy as well. This is at the bottom of the first uh, side you have on your handout. But before I read it, I want to say this. We cannot separate these two agents, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, and expect to have sanctification. I can't just focus on the Holy Spirit and say, I want an experience with the Spirit, right? I want to be filled with that power and I want that, that feeling or whatever it might be. There is no way to test whether that experience is genuine unless I have the Word of God. On the other hand, the Word of God by itself Simply by reading and memorizing the Word of God, there is no mystical, magical power in the printed page itself. It's only as I exercise faith in it and the Holy Spirit takes that Word and works with the power of God in my life. They have to work together. Very, very important that we remember that. Now, let's read together uh, this paragraph. This is Great Controversy, page 469. What is true sanctification? True sanctification is a Bible doctrine. That means a Bible teaching. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonian church, declares, This is the will of God, even your sanctification. And he prays, The very God of peace sanctify you, what? Partially? Just enough to squeak in the door of heaven. What does God want? His will is that we be completely, wholly, entirely sanctified. That's good news, right? Completely, entirely set apart from the world. Completely, entirely 
purified or cleansed from sin so that we can be completely and entirely connected with God. That's the reason. Let's keep reading. The Bible clearly teaches what sanctification is and how it is to be attained. The Savior prayed for his disciples, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul teaches that believers are to be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. There are the two agents that we just were looking at, right? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Reading on. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Jesus told his disciples, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And the psalmist says, Thy law is the truth. This is how we know if our experience with the Spirit is genuine or not. Does it match with the written word of God? Separate the two. Now you're floating in darkness. You have no way to know if what you think you're receiving from the Spirit is actually the right Spirit. By the word and the Spirit of God are open to men the great principles of righteousness embodied in his law. And since the law of God is holy and just and good, a transcript of the divine perfection, it follows that a character formed by obedience to that law will be holy. Christ is a perfect example of such a character. This is why in our very first verses, we read that Paul uh, says we need to grow up into whom? Christ, because he's the perfect example. He says, I have kept my Father's commandments. I do always those things that please Him. So what will a mature Christian look like? Look like Christ, right? We just said, Jesus said, I have kept my Father's commandments. I do always those things that please Him. A mature Christian view on life will be, I only want to do those things that please my Father in heaven, right? And eventually we can reach the place where we would rather suffer or even die than knowingly disappoint our Heavenly Father, than knowingly disobey Him. The followers of Christ are to become like Him by the grace of God to form characters in harmony with the principles of His holy law. This is Bible sanctification. So pretty clear, isn't it? That paragraph is packed full of Bible verses. (laughs) If we want to know what a sanctified life looks like, yes, we look at Jesus, but you can look at the law of God as well. And the process of growth is where God brings our lives into harmony with his word and with his law. How does the work of sanctification begin? Okay, we'll go on the back side of the handout now. How does the work of sanctification begin? We'll look at two verses. The first one is Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. Speaking of Jesus, it says, "...who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins." The work of sanctification begins with what Jesus has done, right? Without Jesus' death, without His blood... There would be no hope of justification, sanctification, or glorification. So sanctification begins with what Jesus has done for us. 1 John 1 verse 7 says that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Right. So it begins with death. That's the key. This process of growth and life begins with death. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? Most of the things in the kingdom of God don't make sense if we are looking at it from a worldly perspective. Remember when Jesus' disciples were arguing about who would be greatest in the kingdom, right? He essentially said, you're looking at this upside down. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you're going to kneel down and you're going to wash your, brother, your brother's feet, right? And here's what it looks like. I'll do it for you. So this process of growth and life begins with Christ's death. Jesus himself said here, this was shortly before he died, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth what? Much fruit. What kind of plants bear fruit? Young plants or mature plants? 
only plants that have matured, right, that have grown. So this life begins with death. And it's not just Christ's death. And this is where many, many Christians miss it, right? We're happy to focus on Christ's death, on what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and we fail to recognize that we too must die. Galatians 2, verse 20, Paul writing, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's scary to die. It's scary to go through the new birth. It's scary to let go control of my life and to trust this person you cannot see. That's scary. And it goes against everything we as human beings are <clears throat> trained by our sinful natures to do. I mean, it just comes naturally. I'm going to hang on. I'm going to control my life. But we must die, right? We must let go. We must allow God to take control. We cannot grow until we do that. How does the work of sanctification continue? Now, you've got a list of seven items. We're going to look up in our Bibles these items here. Let's start with the first one, John 3, verse 5. How does the work of sanctification continue? John 3, verse 5. Back to Nicodemus, right? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of what else? The Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There is nothing mystical or magical about baptism. And if you've been baptized, you realize that. It's not like you come out of the water and all of a sudden the devil can't get at you, right? In fact, you become a target. You come out of that tank or that river with a big cross here on your back. But here is what baptism is supposed to mean in our lives, is that now you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the devil doesn't really like the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't like to be around him. And so if you are full of the Holy Spirit, that's like your force field, right, of protection. And the devil's still going to try, but there is a protective power around you. So here's our first point. The sanctified life is a life of spirit. We must be full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and the Bible tells us in Luke 4, verse 1, that he was full of the Holy Spirit through his entire ministry every single day. We can have the same experience. Let's look at letter B, John 17, verses 20 and 21. Another aspect of how sanctification works in our life. John 17, verse 20, Jesus praying. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, meaning his disciples then, but also for them which shall believe on me through their word. That's us here today. We're here because those disciples shared the good news. Now, verse 21, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So our second point is this that the sanctified life is a life of love and unity. Now, this does not mean that you will automatically just get along great with everybody else that you meet. In fact, Jesus said that if you follow me, if you are growing with me, there will be a sword in your life, at least from time to time. And even members of your own family might choose to turn away. So there is that aspect of it. But what is the goal, right? What does a healthy, growing church look like? Is it one that's fragmented and there's dissension and disagreements every time you come together? Of course not. A healthy, growing church full of growing Christians will demonstrate love and unity, even if there are a few bumps along the way. The overriding goal and purpose of that church will be we must be united, we must be united in truth, but we must stay together, right? Yes. Let's look at number C, letter C, Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, 
verse 12. Great passage. For the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Remember, the word uh, sanctification itself means to separate, right? And this is one aspect of that separation. It doesn't just mean a physical separation from the world, although it may include that. It really means a separation in my mind and my heart, my values, my motives, the things that drive me in my life. Now there is something in my life that is separating out the good from the bad. And that something is the Word of God. So a sanctified life is a life of study of God's Word. Are you reading the Bible every day, right? Are we studying it? Are we asking God to help us live according to what we read in that Word? Incredibly important. Letter D, Ephesians 6, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 18, another aspect of the sanctified life. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The sanctified life is a life of prayer. And prayer takes time, doesn't it? I'm guilty like we all are far too often, of rushing through prayers, not taking the time necessary to communicate with God. But prayer is communication, and communication shouldn't be rushed. And the sanctified life, one of the keys to growing in Christ is to take that time to communicate with Him. Okay, the next one is Matthew 7, verse 20. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus speaking here, he says, Wherefore, by their fruits you do know them. So a sanctified life is a life that is bearing fruit. And you know, we have to be really careful at this point because every one of us are at a different level of maturity, right? And if you're like me, sometimes different days are at different levels of maturity, right? And so my fruit bearing or your fruit bearing is going to look different, than each other. And we have to be really careful that we don't judge each other, right? This is one of the easy ways that it is for us to judge our brothers and our sisters uh, that we care about, but we say, well, why aren't you doing this? Or why why am I not seeing this in your life, right? We need to encourage. That's part of fellowship. But we need to be careful not to judge. And so life of fruit bearing. But if we are growing in Christ, we will be bearing fruit. And one of those things to pray in that time with God each day is, Lord, am I bearing fruit in my life? And if not, why not, right? What, where's the misfire, right? Where's the short circuit in my life? Because I want to continue growing at the pace and the rate that you intend me to grow. And fruit bearing is one of those um, gauges that we have, really for ourselves. Where am I at with you? Lord, help me to bear fruit through your power. Okay, Ephesians 6, verses 12 and 13. I should have put those two together, shouldn't I? In Ephesians chapter 6. Would have saved a few page turns, but turning the pages of the Bible isn't such a bad thing. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. You know these verses. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The sanctified life is a life of spiritual warfare. And if you've been a Christian for very long, you know this all too well. But we have to be prepared for the battle, right? We have to expect it to come today. And so we need that armor of God on. 
And a life that is growing closer in Christ means that as you're growing, right, as we spend more time with Jesus, we will be more effective in that spiritual warfare. We will be experiencing more and more victories more and more continually. That's part of growth. If I'm still struggling with the same things that I did 30 years ago, well, God still loves us. Praise the Lord, right? He still works with us. But God wants us to be able to move past these things because there might be something else He wants to work on in our life, right? That's another gauge. Am I still struggling with the same, the same thing, the same habits, maybe, that I was when I was an infant in Christ? That's another gauge that Jesus can use to help us recognize where we're at with Him. Okay, the last one, Hebrews chapter 10. What does a sanctified life look like? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So a sanctified life is a life of worship, witness, and hope. It's a life of corporate worship as well. This meeting together that we do every week on Sabbath morning, it's incredibly important. That's why we have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. Yes, you need to have your own personal relationship with Jesus, but there is an aspect to the Christian life that only comes in the community of believers. And it makes this thing called church incredibly, incredibly important. And if I am separating or pulling myself out of that community for whatever reason, whether it's hurt or a grievance or a disagreement on some point, if I willingly draw myself out of that communion, then I am giving myself a handicap that is going to make me grow more slowly than Jesus wants. It just hurts me. And it hurts the body as well. So when is the process of sanctification completed? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a great day coming, amen? <laughs> and Jesus wants us to be ready and prepared for it. And the great goal and purpose of sanctification is so that we can stand in Christ's presence and not be ashamed and not run away in terror and not look for a rock or a cave to hide under. And so God promises to continue and to complete this work of sanctification as we approach that day. Now, I want to go back one more time for just a moment to some of these erroneous ideas about sanctification because these are ideas that I'm sure you have heard and they are out there even in our church today. Here's the first one. God loves you. You cannot be lost. There are a lot of people that will tell you this, that God is too loving to allow anybody to be lost. Now, if that was true, what would it do to this whole thing we've been studying today about sanctification or growing in Christ? Well, it would mean that sanctification is simply not a part of salvation, right? You don't need to grow because there's no reason to worry. You will be in heaven. So don't worry about it. Sanctification is not a part of salvation. Well, I think the Bible's, I think we've seen enough scripture this morning that you know that's not true. Sanctification is an important part of the experience of salvation. Here's another idea that is out there, and if you haven't heard it, you will. We will be sinning all the way until the second coming. The idea behind this is we're sinners, we live in a sinful world. It is impossible, even with God's help, to overcome temptation or sin. It's impossible to overcome those habits, those things that separate us from God. What does that do to the idea or the teaching of sanctification? Well, it tells us that sanctification happens in the future, right? If sanctification must happen, and the Bible's clear that it must, if it can't happen now, then it must happen immediately when Jesus comes back. 
And that's what this idea does to sanctification. It's not something that you need to worry about now in your life. It'll happen immediately and automatically when Jesus appears. But that doesn't fit either. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22 that when Jesus comes back, those who are righteous will be righteous still, and those who are filthy will be filthy still. Right? So whatever has to happen in my life, in your life, has to happen before Jesus appears in the clouds. Third and final idea, wrong idea that you will hear, and this one especially is I'm hearing more and more frequently. Jesus accomplished everything at the cross, including your sanctification. So the idea here that you will hear is that you were sanctified at the cross. Jesus has done it all. What does that mean? Well, it would mean that you're already sanctified. And again, you don't have to worry about it. Now, I don't want to judge anybody, so I'll talk about myself. I am not yet fully sanctified. I'm pressing toward that mark by faith and with God's help. But there are things in my life that still are causing me to trip now and then. Okay? So if Jesus truly accomplished everything, including my sanctification at the cross, then he's not a very powerful Savior. That's what it means. And it destroys our faith in God. Here's what Jesus said. Mark 4, verse 28. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Notice the gradual, sequential, but continuous model of growth. As Jesus says, just look at how any plant grows, right? It sprouts out of the ground as a little seed with just one or two leaves. Now, at that stage of growth, is there anything wrong with that little plant? It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. But if I came back a month later, and it was still two little leaves right there, an inch above the ground, it would look like my garden. No. Something's wrong, right? Because growth is supposed to continue. Now, Jesus says, first the blade, and then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. You look at that plant, at every stage of its growth, if it's growing, it's perfect, because it's right where it's supposed to be at that stage of growth. And so when Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, that's what he means. If you're a baby Christian, then just trust in God, right? That's perfect. If you're a young Christian, continue growing, right? You've gained some victories. There are more to come. Keep trusting in God. That is a perfect experience. If you are a mature Christian and you've experienced great victories in your life and there's still a few things that God is working on, but you're trusting in Him, that's perfect. That's a perfect experience. And if you continue growing like that, steadily but day by day, God will complete His work in you. And he will fulfill his promise. We just read it there in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. God has promised that he will make you ready to stand in his presence. And now it's his problem, right? Now it's his deal. Now it's our job to trust and to allow him to continue working in our lives. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life. And the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or what? Die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility, and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. We should never reach the place where we believe that we have arrived. Amen. Right? Where God has finished His work in me, and now I'm just waiting for all of you to catch up. That's not sanctification. That's presumption. It's a dangerous place to be. 
But Jesus has promised this, Jude 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Right? This is on him. It's his responsibility to finish his work in your life. It's his honor at stake. And he will do it. His word is true. Your job is to trust him day by day. And every day to say yes to Jesus. Now you've got just a little space left at the bottom of your paper. Or you can pick anywhere on your page that you wish. But I want to challenge you this morning. We all have things in our life that we know are separating us from him. Or that could be better if we were to allow him access to that part of our life. So I want to challenge you. And this is private. This is personal, right? No one ever has to see this. Somewhere on that paper, write down, Lord, I need victory over this in my life. I need to grow in this area of my life. And I am asking you to fulfill your promise in my life through your word and your Holy Spirit. Just write it down. Then tuck that paper away in your Bible somewhere and start praying about it every single day. And ask God and expect Him to work that miracle in your life. And He will do it. All right? So that paper is yours. That is your challenge. It's God's challenge to work it in your life. Growing in Christ, one of the most important aspects of our Christian experience. I believe Jesus is coming soon, which means he has a lot of work to do in me. He has a lot of work to do in each one of us. But as we remain focused on him and united together as a church family, we'll keep growing. And we will reflect the image of Christ through his power working within us. Is that an experience you want? You feel the need of it in your life. You commit to making that a daily prayer. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song today.